it's very important to the process of understanding Google Cloud and pass the certification exam that you go through the question and attempt answering it yourself first. So pause the video, work through the question. We'll catch up in just a little while and I'll show you how I do it. This project scenario is based on the Monker Games case study. You're the data compliance officer for Monker Games and must protect customers' personally identifiable information or PII. Monker Games wants to make sure they can generate anonymized usage reports about the new game and delete PII data after a specific period of time. The solution should have minimal cost. You need to ensure compliance while meeting business and technical requirements. What should you do? Let's look at the key requirements that are there in this scenario. First, make sure that they can generate anonymized usage reports. So we have to be able to remove information that identifies any particular user. It is okay to get aggregate information, um, cumulated information, but at the same time, we should not be a leaking or having data that identifies a particular user. So things like, for example, a phone number, an email address, all of this would identify a user and that is not allowed as part of these reports. Second, must protect customers' personally identifiable information or PII. Now, when you say remove PII data, the first product that should come to mind on Google Cloud would be the Data Loss Prevention API, okay, the DLP API. So whatever solution we choose, whatever option we choose, should have DLP integrated as part of it. Third, delete PII data after a specific period of time. So there should be a way to manage the life cycle of the data. We should be able to say, we have to expire this data and autom automatically have it deleted after a certain amount of time, right? be it days or weeks, or in many cases, it might be years. Fourth, the solution should have minimal cost. So any existing easy to configure solution that is already ready made would be preferable over something that we have to build ourselves. Lastly, ensure compliance while meeting business and technical requirements. This would be applicable to every um, requirement, right? That they, we have to meet the requirements for the business and also the compliance requirements. In this particular case, it refers to the two things about anonymizing the data and about expiring the data automatically after a set period of time. Now, as I said, when you're talking about removing um, personally identifiable information, the first product that should come to mind is the DLP API or the Data Loss Prevention API. We're going to look at a couple of examples of this to see why this is useful and when it can be applied. Now, in this case, let's say we've collected some data, right? So there are some comments that has particular emails or particular phone numbers or particular social security numbers, right? It identifies an individual uniquely. What DLP does in this case, after it runs is to remove or redact that particular information, that personally identifiable information and says, you know, we've removed it, we found an email and now we've removed it, right? So we found an SSN, we found an email and that has been redacted or removed. So this is one way in which the DLP API works. There could be other cases where we say, you know what, we identify it's a phone number and we will mask the information, right? So in this case, we're masking the information that would uniquely identify a user, but we still retain the area code, right? So it allows us to have aggregate information related to say that area, but we still can't identify that this belongs to one particular person. Another option is to bucketize the data. So if you see in this case, originally this was senior engineer and VP engineer, but after you bucketize it, you say, hey, this is just part of the engineering team. Right. Uh, instead of having a senior ops manager and a junior ops manager that might be able to specifically identify a, a employee within the company, we say we bucketize and say there is this is somebody in the ops team, but we have no further information. Right. So again, we have anonymized the data and we can't figure out who this exact person is. In certain cases, we might also choose to just randomize the numbers without redacting, removing, masking, any of that because maybe later stages in that pipeline require this particular format, right? So if we replace this with a bunch of hashes or with a square bracket saying you found numbers, it will fail in a later stage where they expect digits to be there, right? So in certain cases, we could do something like randomization. These are different ways, but not the only ones that allow you to anonymize data, right? So 
This is very much useful when you are ingesting data and when you ingest the data, when you receive the data, some of the information has to be there, right? For example, the user's email ID or phone number. We need probably to collect that as a part of a transaction. But we probably don't need to retain that for later analysis, right? And the more you retain the data, the greater there's going to be a chance of a leak, right? Through accidentally through the analytics team or somewhere down that, um, down the various stages of the data analytics. And the best way to do it is to remove that data as soon as possible, right? Maybe you have to store it somewhere else for some kind of, um, as, as part of some kind of compliance, but you don't need to retain it for the analysis, right? This is also uh, a way in which to get customers who are currently private, running a private data center to move to the public cloud because they would be fearful about their data going to the public cloud and they don't yet know how to handle security there. So one of the ways is, you know, don't bring in your full data, bring in anonymized data, right? So it makes it easy for them to bring in data for analysis while still retaining some of their systems on-premise or elsewhere. Now, data loss prevention API clearly is applicable to this question. However, when we look at the options, none of these options mention DLP, right? So we have to assume that DLP is going to be applied and we have to find an option that has a product or solution that integrates well with DLP, right? So DLP is clearly an important part of this question, but since it's not part of the option, we assume that it is a implicit requirement, right? And whatever product has to integrate well with it. Um, with that understanding now, let's look at the options. Option A suggests archive audit logs and cloud storage and manually generate reports. So what are the things we need now, right? If you're going to archive it in cloud storage, one, it has to be uh, integratable or integrable with um, with DLP. It also has to have lifecycle management. So let's see if that is supported. Cloud storage does support lifecycle management. So for example, if you have some object within a bucket, we can choose to say that after a certain number of days, we want to be able to automatically delete it. So in this case, we selected an object and then we've chosen an age of 30 days. And we're saying now at the end of 30 days, automatically delete that uh, object, right? So lifecycle management is a key part of cloud storage. So that works for us. What about the integration with DLP? In cloud storage, if you go to an object within the bucket, and then if you, write, if you click on this um, menu, you will see that there is an option to scan the data with cloud DLP, right? And when you click that, it will automatically bring up the source object in the URL. So clearly we can go via cloud storage and apply DLP. Uh, you can also go via the data loss prevention console UI itself and then say, hey, we want to um, trigger a job when there's new data and we can put in that URL ourselves. So either ways, there is a good integration between cloud storage and DLP, and obviously you can apply this programmatically also. So in evaluating this option, we can run DLP jobs and data on cloud storage. So that's good. It, cloud storage also has lifecycle management, so that also works for us. However, the second part of this option to manually generate reports is clearly cumbersome, right? And this requires significant overheads in terms of time and cost. And for that reason alone, we will reject option A. What about option B? Option B suggests write a cloud logging filter to export specific date ranges to PubSub. Now, the first thing is we need to have DLP integration. And there is no DLP integration with cloud logging, right? So cloud logging does not have a direct way to integrate the data loss prevention API. Of course, you can export it to other uh, data sinks, right? And apply DLP there, but not directly in cloud logging. So it would require extra work, right? There's more time required to do that. The second thing is that PubSub does not have a way to have lifecycle management, at least for the kind of persistent data that uh, stays with us for probably years, right? PubSub is this uh, product that allows serverless scaling of at the point of data ingestion, right? So when data is coming in, we have to have a way to capture it reliably, right? Irrespective of how much data is coming in and PubSub is able to automatically expand and contract depending on the demand. Uh, 
However, it does not have a way to retain the data for extremely long periods of time, or at least it's not efficient to do that in PubSub. Right? So PubSub itself does not have lifecycle management of the uh, nature that we want, which could be stretching into years. It does have for a certain number of days, it could retain the data, but um, usually not beyond that, right? So in general, option B does not work well for us. Option C suggests that we archive audit logs in BigQuery and generate reports using Google Data Studio. So again, look at, let's look at the key requirements and see if BigQuery works uh, with respect to those requirements. The, with, uh, on the integration of DLP, right? If you have a data set in BigQuery and a table there, I've created a sample. If you click the export on that table, there is an option there to say scan with DLP. And once you do that, similar to the earlier one we saw with cloud storage, it brings up a UI where that data uh, information, right, that source information is already filled in, which says the storage type is BigQuery in this case, from which project is it coming, uh, which data set and which table. And based on that, we will now be able to run our DLP API job. What about lifecycle management? It is possible to set um, expiry on data sets and tables for uh, on BigQuery, right? So when you create a data set, you can set a um, table expiration date for any table that is created within this data set, right? So in this case, for example, I've enabled uh, table expiration and I've set 100 days. And I created this, uh, I think on September 12th. So once I uh, create any new table within this data set now, it is automatically going to set that uh, table expiration, right? So in this case, between September 12th and December 21st, there is there are 100 days. So this is automatic. For any new table, it is going to inherit this table expiration. Now, in one particular case, we might say, you know what, we don't want the default. We want to keep it something different. You can do that. You can choose a table. There is an option called edit details. And when you do that, um, you can change the expiration. So in this case, I'm in the process of going from September 12th to just September 19th. So I want the table to expire in seven days. So in general, BigQuery does allow um, data lifecycle management. You know, you can expire, say for example, one of the en entities you can set uh, automatic expiry for is a uh, table. What about the second part of the question, Google Data Studio? What exactly is this? This is currently a free product as part of the Google Cloud offerings, which allows you to visualize data from a variety of different sources, right? Uh, BigQuery is definitely one of them. And apart from that, there's MySQL, PostgreSQL. Um, you can also put CSV files within cloud storage and say, let's pull out the data from that. You can also integrate it with Google's uh, marketing platforms and consumer product platforms with the Google Workspace tools like Google Sheets and also with um, other social media platforms like Reddit, Facebook, Twitter, and all of that. So this becomes a well-integrated solution that clearly works with our requirement in this case, BigQuery, and is easy to set up, and it is also free of cost. So let's evaluate this option again, uh, to, which was to archive audit logs on BigQuery and generate reports using Google Data Studio. As we saw, BigQuery has integration with the Data Loss Prevention API, so that's good. BigQuery is perfect to run large-scale analytics uh, queries using C uh, SQL, right? Um, with the kind of data that we have, BigQuery is extremely powerful in not only storing the data, but also analyzing the data very quickly. Right? So in case of any kind of reports that we need to generate, right? after DLP is done, we've got a lot of anonymous data and now it becomes easy to create um, or, or to um, you know pull out the data that we want to later visualize. Um, as part of the lifecycle management for the data, BigQuery does allow setting expiry for tables and partitions. The visualization option that is uh, recommended here or suggested here, Google Data Studio is free. BigQuery is expensive. So the uh, requirement to have minimal cost is also met with this option. Finally, it's fairly straightforward to connect the BigQuery data to Data Studio and to visualize it. So overall, all the um, uh, all the uh, checkboxes are ticked when it comes to option C and therefore it seems a really good option. Obviously, we haven't seen the last option yet, so we will keep this on hold, but this looks like a good option so far. 
The last option recommends that we archive user logs on a locally attached persistent disk and CAD them to a text file for auditing. So what does this do? Right? So essentially you're saying that you've got something like a hard disk and it is attached to a, a, a VM and when the VM goes down potentially the hard disk is also not uh, accessible or you can't pull data from that and the process of doing the analysis on that also seems to be manual right you cat them out to a text file and then you audit it review it you run uh, whatever kind of processing you can do on that with respect to e dlp there is no inter direct integration between the data source which is an attached persistent disk and to uh, run dlp on that so that becomes a little bit of a problem apart from that there is no built-in lifecycle management in persistent disk you will have to come up with your own solution clearly that is not going to be good for us and finally, on the text file itself, there will be a lot of additional work required to do analytics, right? It's not as easy or straightforward a solution as the previous one we saw, which would be BigQuery. So considering all of that, D is just not a good option and we can reject that. Looking at all the options that we reviewed, clearly option C would be the best one for us, which would be to um, archive the audit logs in BigQuery and to generate reports using Google Data Studio. If you find these videos useful, consider supporting me on Patreon or buy me a coffee. Also, don't forget to like, share and subscribe for more learning videos on Awesome GCP.